This is CBC Here and Now. What you're seeing on social media is not a reflection of what's going on in Alberta. A lot of people not thinking critically and sort of blaming those of us back here in Newfoundland. I mean, it is, it's surprising. I don't think we see that kind of thing between, uh, between the regions very often. This is just a little dumpster fire that's been blown out of proportion because Facebook and Twitter blow everything out of proportion. Tensions riding high between this province and Alberta over Monday's election result, with name-calling, hurt feelings, and misunderstandings. Why are Albertans pointing the blame at Newfoundland and Labrador? Well, good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Peter Cowan. The federal election was filled with personal attacks, and even though that race is over, the insults continue. Now it's people in this province facing abuse from Albertans. Here now's Meg Roberts joins us live. Meg, I know a lot of people may have seen this stuff in their social media feeds, but can you lay out for us just exactly what's being said here? The comments started almost immediately after Justin Trudeau won a minority government. Comments like stupid newfies resurrecting some old stereotypes. It has people talking about the division in the country and the attitude moving forward. Monday night, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians voted almost all red. Alberta, almost all blue. Unsurprising results in both provinces, but it's a feud between the two which is catching people off guard. Some Albertans feel like liberal voters in this province betrayed them by not voting conservative, particularly since many people from this province moved to Alberta for jobs. An oil advocate in Fort McMurray says the comments are made out of frustration. The people who come and fly here work because their provinces are struggling or whatever for years then they leave and it's like, okay, whatever, I don't like it there. Like, it, 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 it hurts. Chris LeDrew is one St. John's resident who took to Facebook to voice his opinion. He says most of the people he's seen complaining are Newfoundlanders and Labradorians who have moved to Alberta. And he finds the insults rather petty. I don't see very many people, lazy people around here, so th these stereotypes bother me, especially when most of the people I know are really hard-working people who are still in Newfoundland, mind you, and still here, you know, helping to maintain the, you know, the success of this place. And this is a thriving province, contrary to what a lot of people think. LeDrew also points to the numbers. In Newfoundland and Labrador, total votes for the Liberals number just over 107,000. In Alberta, the total votes for the Liberals were over 280,000. Despite the population differences, more people in Alberta voted Liberal than in Newfoundland and Labrador. Jim Brown, a CBC journalist who has worked in St. John's and now in Calgary, says Albertans are feeling vulnerable right now, but he doesn't expect this online drama to last. And the drama is mainly contained to social media, not real life. This is just a little dumpster fire that's been blown out of proportion because Facebook and Twitter blow everything out of proportion. It's, it's not who Albertans are, it's not who Newfoundlanders in Alberta are, it's just a, a little wacko, bizarre eruption that hopefully we will have all forgotten about by the end of the weekend. While this divide playing out on social media may fizzle, many political analysts say this election exposed some regional divisions across Canada that Justin Trudeau will have to tackle. Peter. Thank you. The CBC's Meg Roberts with us live tonight. Continuing with the fallout from the election, the Prime Minister spoke today for the first time since Monday. He says he's been reflecting on the shutout from two western provinces. People in Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, have been suffering and struggling because of circumstances beyond their control. And uh, we have, over the past few years, endeavoured to be supportive. As part of that endeavour, Trudeau says he's spoken to Premiers Jason this Kenney and Scott Moe to make sure Western concerns are heard. And he insists his minority government will proceed with the construction of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. That's a project the New Democrats oppose. Trudeau also said he's willing to work with other parties, but is ruling out a coalition. His cabinet will be sworn in November 20th. Back in this province, Matthew Twine is a man who poses an above-average risk for sexual violence. That's according to the Parole Board of Canada. Twine is expected to appear in court tomorrow on two counts of breaching court orders. Our Arianna Kelland has delved into his background and has his story, but first a warning. Some may find the details of this case disturbing. 
The parole board doesn't have anything good to say about Matthew Twine. The 33-year-old is a sex offender with a 20-page criminal record. He made headlines in St. John's in 2017 when he was sentenced for exposing himself to young teenagers at a dance studio. Now CBC has obtained a series of parole documents outlining concerns about him reoffending, his fixation toward young females, and his failure to recognize that he's a sex offender. Parole documents say Twine's troubling behavior started when he was a child. He held a pellet gun to someone's head and pulled the trigger without knowing if it was loaded. And he also held a gun to a family member's head and pushed them down the stairs. You kick someone in the leg and stabbed other children with pencils while at school. As a child, you were characterized as very aggressive and disruptive, the parole board said. Twine also has a history of hurting and killing small animals. While in a halfway house in January, Twine landed in more trouble. When your belongings were itemized, two pictures of prepubescent teens that appeared to be ripped out of magazines were found taped behind your night table. Twine finished his federal sentence and was released several weeks ago, but the RNC shared the same concerns as the parole board and pushed to put Twine under strict conditions. The RNC alleges he breached two orders almost immediately, landing him back in jail. He's expected to appear in court tomorrow morning. Arianna Kellen, CBC News, St. John's. Well, you can't fly from St. John's to Europe directly anymore, but there are some people trying to change that. My co-host Jeremy Eaton is live at the St. John's airport tonight. Jeremy, what are you focusing on? So, Peter, it's been nearly a year since the direct flight from St. John's to Dublin was cancelled, and some people are not letting it go very easily. There's a group who's trying to fight to bring it back. I'm going to talk to a member from that group and tell you about what they're doing. Coming up later on the show. Peter. Not a whole lot going on weather-wise today. It's actually pretty quiet. We did see a, a few peaks of sun in the metro area. That's since ended, but we do uh, have a little bit of clearing. It looks like along the uh, eastern portion of the Avalon, and some sun did peak out uh, for parts of the west coast as well. Those temperatures uh, still quite chilly today, only reaching the single digits, eight degrees in St. John's. Uh, Ten was the high in Stephenville. That was the warm spot across the province, but uh, as much as we are not seeing too much weather wise right now, things are about to change. We do have a rec house wind warning still in place. Uh, just checked a couple of minutes ago and it looks like gusts upwards of about 90 kilometers per hour being reported in the rec house area. We're looking at those winds picking up tonight to upwards of 110. Most of us are going to see some windy conditions. There's snow in the forecast for Lab West and then rain as we head through the day tomorrow. I'll have all the details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. The RNC chief is doing damage control today. Joel Boland is reassuring vulnerable people in the province the police can be trusted. Here now's Megan McCabe is live outside RNC headquarters in St. John's, where Boland held a one-hour news conference earlier today. Megan, what's this all about? It's a story with a timeline that goes back a few years, and it's a complicated tale involving a division within local community groups that work to prevent violence against women and girls. Sex work around the Livingstone Street neighborhood in downtown St. John's, the police and the province. But today was about an article published earlier this month by The Independent. It included emails between Boland and Linda Ross, former head of the Provincial Advisory Council on the Status of Women. It basically alleges that the pair conspired to have Jenny Wright removed as head of the St. John Status of Women Center. Boland says he had concerns about how this tweet from Wright painted all police officers as abusers. Boland and Ross and several others signed a letter last fall asking to meet with the center's board to discuss their various concerns about Wright. But Boland says no one asked for her termination and in fact the letter says they believe, quote, the damaged relationship can be repaired. You know, I'm troubled by what has taken place here. Work very hard, our officers work very hard here to build relationships in this community. As I said, you know what, the people that today that really, really the fallout of this will be is for vulnerable people in our community and some of the residents when I think about the people that live down on Livingstone Street. If there's anybody that has been failed here, it's them. Okay, so the chief maintains he didn't push right out of her position and he's worried about the public perception, how community groups and the public may not like how he got involved, but 
What does Jenny Wright have to say about all this? Wright's working in Halifax now, and she says that her decision to leave the Women's Centre in March was completely on her own terms. She says she's never felt silenced and it's not unusual for people to disagree on important issues. But she also says that that letter was a factor in her decision to leave. I mean, the real point of this is that this isn't about me. This is about our current government officials and our chief of police monitoring and surveilling citizens within our province, monitoring their social media, and then deciding to take action on, on, on comments or ideas that they don't like. And it's that issue, what police and the Status of Women Council did or what people think they did about a feminist activist they disagreed with that prompted First Light to pull out of the Committee on Violence Against Women and Girls. And they want government to hold Boland and Ross accountable for stifling critical voices. It's like they weren't comfortable with the challenging of the systems and I feel that all of our community organizations should be able to freely express uh, the challenges with the colonial systems which exist, and we should be able to speak up and advocate against these systems and challenge the structures. As for their call to government, the Women's Policy Office says that it's not getting involved and that it had nothing to do with Wright's departure from the Women's Center, but that it hopes to work with First Light more in the future. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Megan McCabe in St. John's. Students at Munn are considering increasing their fees to help pay for the education of a refugee student. There's a referendum at the university next month asking students if they want to pay two bucks per semester to support the program. Here now, Cease Hair explains. Access to education is a dream for young refugees around the world, but there's a group of students here at Munn who hope to change that. This scholarship has changed my life. It gave me the opportunity of a good education to build my future, to pursue my dreams. Hussam Basima from Syria studies physics at Munn and says he can relate to young refugees around the world. I know how they feel. I know the feeling of that when you know that you can do something to fix this crisis, but you only need the education, uh, but the education is not available. Basima is part of a student-led group looking to establish a refugee student sponsorship program at MUN. And in order for that to happen, MUN students would have to agree in a referendum to pay $2 per semester to cover all living and education expenses of a student for one year. In order to get the green light for the referendum, Basima and his group were told they had to get 1,100 names on a petition. That, he says, was not a problem. In order to have the referendum. And we actually collected over 1,700 signatures uh, in less than three weeks. So uh, there is an incredible amount of support from Memorial University students for this program, and we're very excited. Nabila Qureshi on the organizing committee says talk from students on campus is positive. Just the fact that a student can be here amongst us a year from now uh, and we as an institution can help support that student realize his or her dreams. The student refugee program has been in place in universities since the late 70s and if MUN students vote yes, this would be a first for Memorial. Who can apply? Qureshi says any refugee students in Kenya, Malawi, Tanzania, Uganda, Jordan, and Lebanon can. Organizers hope to welcome their first refugee student in the fall of next year. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Looking at national news now, a young mother's death in Saskatchewan has prompted an outpouring of sympathy. Allie Jenkins passed away Sunday from labor complications while giving birth to a baby girl who is in critical conditions. Jenkins was a curler. She's survived by her husband and three young children, including the newborn. A GoFundMe page has been set up for the family. Canada has one of the lowest maternal death rates in the world, but the number of women who have died here because of pregnancy-related problems has actually gone up over the past two decades. Hundreds of tons of plastic bags are piling up in Canadian sorting facilities. They used to get sent to China, but the country has beefed up rules on what crosses its borders to be recycled. 
As the CBC's Gabrielle Fami reports, sorting facilities in New Brunswick are having trouble finding other buyers. This is just a very small portion of everything that we have. It's not a pretty sight or smell. Mountains of plastic piling up at this Moncton sorting center. 16 tons a month with nowhere to go. We're currently stockpiling it. For decades, China bought half of the world's used plastic. Its booming manufacturing sector fueling the demand for recyclables. But with the country generating more waste of its own, it's cracking down on imports. Don't bother sending dirty plastic, it won't get through. Since 2017, those restrictions have only gotten tighter. Fredericton was one of the few places that continued to sell its plastic waste to China, but that ended last month. And other Asian destinations for our used plastic have had enough too. This is garbage from Canada. It's always disappointing when you see something like that happen. Right now, no one wants these. Mostly you can see it's our blue bags and shopping bags. Um, we also have bread bags, milk bags, apple bags. People like Jenna Alderson are trying to find buyers here at home. But used plastic is a tough sell. It's hard to break down and dirt clings to it. So for now, it piles up. Yep. Uh, it's kind of stashed away a little bit everywhere. Um, in St. John, they're starting to wonder if recycling itself isn't part of the problem. Does it in fact lower their impetus to try to reuse their plastic bags or to reduce the number of plastic bags that they get in the first place? The Fundy Regional Service Commission will make its recommendation on what to do with plastic bags next month. It'll then be up to each municipality to adapt its recycling program. The real solution needs to be nationwide. Canada has promised to ban plastic bags by 2021, but that's at the earliest. In the meantime, you can still put those bags in the recycling, but better still, don't take them from the store in the first place. Gabrielle Fami, CBC News, Moncton. There's a live look uh, outside right now. Sun's uh, set. We've got some cloud cover in play as we speak. Some rain on the way tomorrow. I'll have all the details coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. And Ashley, I'm not sure I'm ready for it to be dark out at this time of the day. That's always a sign that the weather's headed in the wrong direction. Yeah. And, you know, seeing Megan outside in the dark and seeing that live shot, uh, it's just yeah. a reminder it's going to get a whole lot worse before it gets better. It is, and uh, we're about a week and a half now away from uh, a 440 sunset. So. <laughs> oh, that, right, because daylight savings time daylight is going to end, time. and yeah, it gets even 3rd. worse. It does, it gets even worse. But, uh, you know, today we did see a little bit of sunshine, though, before uh, it did get dark. We saw some... Uh, clear breaks in the uh, satellite this afternoon. We'll take a look at the temperatures right now though. Those, they uh, have dropped a couple of degrees. You can still see that onshore flow. Uh, seven degrees for St. John's and then eight down through Port of Basque now. And those temperatures around three degrees for Lab City as we speak. Now taking a look at that satellite, I mentioned a few uh, clear breaks a little earlier today. You can still see that onshore flow uh, visible on the satellite, but then the next round of weather is moving in. So we're starting to see that cloud cover move in for the western portion, at least the southwestern portion of the island. If we uh, zoom out again, you can see. So we did see some thunderstorms over the maritime provinces. We're not going to see any thunderstorms here, but we are going to see some rain as we head through the night tonight and those winds are going to be quite strong as well. So as I mentioned, the wreck house area under a wind warning gusts of 110 kilometers per hour tonight. Uh, the Port Basque area really the, the strongest winds will be for the southwestern portion anywhere from 60 to about 80 kilometers per hour tonight. And then we'll see those winds strong through the day tomorrow as that system moves over. So we're looking at between 60 and 70 kilometer per hour gusts, depending on where you are. Uh, Twilling Gate could see those gusts uh, that strong as well as the Northern Peninsula uh, as the cold front moves through. So here's a look at that system as it brings in some rains. First gonna hit Lab West and those temperatures are gonna dip tonight and that means the rain that will fall will change over to snow or at least a wet snow tonight. And we'll start to see some periods of rain move in specifically for the southern portion of the island overnight tonight. That's where we're going to see most of that rainfall. Your temperatures uh, not really moving much around eight degrees, but again, uh, exposed areas seeing gusts upwards of 70, maybe even 80 kilometer per hour winds. Uh, six degrees for St. John's tonight, four for St. Anthony, and you're still looking at that chance of showers. And then right now it's looking as much as five to potentially 10 centimeters in the higher elevations is where you'll see the highest amounts more than likely because uh, those temperatures will be hovering around the zero degree mark for Lab West, but uh, it still looks like it'll be a wet snow. So you'll see the grassy surfaces certainly with that snow. Otherwise, we're looking at about four degrees for Nain tonight. So that rain will move through the island into tomorrow, likely some clearing in behind that. You're going to hang on to those cooler temperatures for Lab West. So you're still looking at uh, the chance of some flurries, but otherwise it is looking like it'll be a, a generally gray day for most of the big land as well. And as much as uh, 10 to 20 millimeters of rain falling for the south coast, as I mentioned, uh, for you up through Labrador, you're still looking at somewhere between five to 10 millimeters, maybe upwards of about 20 by the time that's all said and done Friday morning. So here's a look at your temperatures. Uh, pretty 10 degrees is what we're looking at. So pretty similar to today but by a couple more degrees. But again, breezy conditions right across the board. Uh, Corner Brook looking at 10 for tomorrow or 11 tomorrow rather. And then we've got those uh, cooler temperatures up through Labrador still hanging on to those single digits, though, eight degrees. And then uh, Lab City, you're sitting around four degrees. Those winds will be generally around 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. So that's a look at your forecast for now. We'll look ahead coming back. <clears throat> Thanks, Ashley. And you always need a good forecast if you're heading out on a flight. And it's been nearly a year since WestJet canceled its direct flight from St. John's to Dublin, Ireland, but not sitting well with some travelers. We've got Jeremy Eaton with us here live. Jeremy, you were mentioning a petition. Uh, what exactly is happening here? So there's a group called Newfoundland Ireland Direct. They're unhappy with WestJet's decision to discontinue the flight from St. John's straight into Dublin. So they put a petition online and garnered a lot of signatures, about 2,500 last time I checked, but they wanted to take it a step further. But to tell us more about this, I want to introduce Dave Connors. Dave, thanks for joining us. Hi, how are you today? Good. So Dave, tell me a little bit about the group. Why is it important for Newfoundland and Labrador to have this flight straight into Ireland? Well, here we are sitting on the edge of North America, having to go either to Halifax or even back to Toronto to go and fly to, Hal to Ireland. Just doesn't make any sense. I've been uh, privileged. I've, fl I've flown myself 
twice to Ireland in the last three years. I spent 17 days the first time and 30 days last, uh, last year. And it's four and a half hours, and it just makes for a comfortable flight. And being Newfoundlanders and having such a great connection to Ireland, if you look at the numbers of Newfoundlanders that have direct con uh, connections to Ireland, there's a steady flow of people back and forth. And, and in the times I flew, I was aware that there was as many people flying from Ireland to see Newfoundland as there are people from Newfoundland who want to go back and see their homeland, if you will. Uh, so it just makes sense to do this. So it started with the petition that you had, but now you're taking a step forward. You're having a meeting on Sunday. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, the purpose of the meeting on Sunday is, is to really bring together the final f uh, portion of that. We've gotten all the signatures. Uh, we, have a, we have laid a plan to present our petition uh, to government to let them know that we really want them to support what we're doing and we need some, uh, some real direction to get Newfoundland the focus that people should have in getting a flight out of Newfoundland. We need, we need that connection. We not only are connecting to Ireland, we're connecting to Europe. Let's face it. So you find it a little bit, we've talked about this, we've talked a couple of times today, do you find it a little bit disheartening that uh, we just had the 100th anniversary of Alcock and Brown doing the first transatlantic flight and here we are at St. John's International Airport and we can't take a transatlantic flight without going west first? Oh, disheartening is not the word. I've, prior to the direct flight having been put in place, I, had, I, I have flown to Europe before that. I've gone to Germany and I've had to fly to Montreal or Toronto uh, to get there, which adds at least six more hours to the flight, and coming back the very same way, it's it, it, it more than disheartening, it's disappointing, and I feel sometimes that, that we're kind of like, we're back to that second-hand Canadian uh, attitude. We never can do things from a logical perspective. Here we are, we're on the edge of North America, recognize that and make sure that there are flights that take us east the very same way that they take us west, directly. All right, Dave, we're going to have to wrap it up there, but I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank so uh, his group, Newfoundland Ireland Direct, will be meeting at the BIS, the Benevolent Irish Society, uh, in St. John's on Sunday at 1.30 if people want to attend. But Dave, there is some good news. I did get a statement from the uh, airport authority here, and I'm just going to have to read it off the card, uh, my piece of paper here. The business case for a direct flight to Ireland is strong, and the airport authority is actively pursuing a new airline to fill this route. Now, we look forward to making an announcement in the future, but due to competitive nature of the industry, they don't want to speak publicly about it just yet. Now, I did reach out to Destination to St. John's to get their thoughts on the lack of a transatlantic flight here at a St. John's International Airport, and we're going to hear from them later on in the show. People that you see on Twitter getting angry about this are really the kind of uh, smallest, thinnest slice uh, uh, of uh, the Alberta population. While the insults keep coming in the nasty fallout from the federal election, not everyone is angry at Newfoundlanders and Labradorians for voting Liberal. More on that story ahead.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Many people were shocked by the anti-Newfoundland sentiment out of Alberta, but Scott Matthews is warning people not to confuse what a few people say online with how most people in the province are thinking about the election. I spoke with the political science professor about it today at Memorial University. There may be something about this particular outcome that's making uh, those people angry, but I imagine they, you know, started the day feeling uh, angry about politics in this country um, and already had quite a lot of emotion. So it's uh, maybe, maybe the uh, election result, uh, I mean, certainly the election result will have um, uh, sort of activated some of their angry emotions, but they were already there. Um, and and, and what, what, what is the source of that? Uh, I mean, politics in Alberta right now, the economic situation in Alberta um, is such that there are a lot of people with, uh, with grievances and grievances specifically directed at uh, Ottawa and a Liberal government that a lot of them, uh, not all of them, but, you know, of course, a, a very large majority of them don't seem to support. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that's a lot of what this um, is maybe ultimately uh, rooted in, but the, the people that you see on Twitter getting angry about this are really the kind of uh, smallest, thinnest slice uh, uh, of uh, the Alberta population. I, I think even Albertans who are very, you know, uh, angry with Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government, um, I, I doubt there are very many of them at all uh, who think that Newfoundland and Labrador or, or any other province is particularly responsible. Um, and, and frankly, if there is a province they're probably in, in a big way directing their anger towards, it's Ontario, right? I mean, Ontario is the, uh, you know, uh, the usual uh, foil, you know, the usual, uh, 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 you know, bete noir for um, people in Western Canada when they're feeling aggrieved. Um, and I say that as a, as a Westerner, a, a, a transplanted Westerner and, uh, from British Columbia, though. Um, but uh, so I, I, I just think it's it's very very unrepresentative about uh, of how most Albertans are um, uh, feeling about this province and even feeling about the election outcome. I think it's a it's a it's a really uh, a rare kind of unusual uh, reaction, and that's what social media seems to be about when it comes to politics. How much do you think the messaging we heard from the parties and some of these personal attacks that we saw during the campaign? and some of the third parties and the memes that we're seeing uh, that end up being like, for example, you know, targeting Trudeau very personally and specifically may contribute to this sort of response. Yeah, so I mean, uh, that is uh, sort of the grist for the, the partisan mill and uh, that kind of information, those, you know, memes, uh, these, are the, these are the people who are most likely to uh, absorb that and uh, think about it. Uh, I think a, a lot of Canadians, a lot of Albertans won't have absorbed uh, any of that sort of uh, fringe commentary uh, on the election. Um, but, you know, but these are precisely the people who would. Um, and I imagine that this has uh, kind of helped to, um, you know, reinforce and justify some of the anger people were already feeling. I mean, that's one thing we know about partisans is that they don't just passively, you know, wait for political information to come to them. They actually actively go and look for information that con con confirms the attitudes they already have, the angry feelings. Um, uh, and so the, the uh, you know, heightened availability of this kind of stuff during an election campaign is, uh, you know, a really rich uh, buffet uh, for uh, people with, with these kinds of strong feelings. Well, thank you very much for sharing your feelings with me today. Yeah, my pleasure. Now let's get back to one of our other top stories, the controversy swirling around the RNC chief and the former head of the St. John's Status of Women Council. Joe Boland is accused of trying to oust Jenny Wright from the group. He explained that it all began with a tweet by Wright that sent a chill through the police force, one that he feels jeopardized the public's confidence in officers. See, it's not, I don't have an issue with, with Miss Wright, the we media, to, or anybody calling out an officer, is when it, the, it was a general characterization of police officers or abusers. That's where the issue came in that tweet. I didn't have, a, I didn't have any issue about the criticism of me. The issue was about characterizing police officers as abusers. That's how I read the tweet, and that's the reason I wanted to speak to the board of directors about it. 
He's, she's speaking specifically about one officer in this matter, a man who, who that's, is, that's who is in a position of trust. In his case, the voice of the, he's being specific here. So, 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 so yeah, she, so but she but tweets with basically not, an accurate not, account no. of, what, of what's happening here, and you take an issue with that. Hang on, no. So go right down to the bottom and read the part that I read. And it's, uh, this is the quote from the tweet. So you're right about the first part of it? Yeah. And there's a part there that criticizes me and my community involvement and everything else. But the part, and I said this, the part that I had issue with and the part that our officers had issue with, they didn't have, off, they didn't have issue with criticizing Canoe, right? They had issue with, and for the love of all that's holy, understand why positions of power like police are so attractive to abusers. This, is, this profession attracts abusers to come and work here. That's a general characterization that we have problem with. And the problem with it is not, is not labeled at any one person, it's the profession, is that, you know, when people, Ms. Fry is not just anybody in our community. She is a very well-respected, she is a very uh, connected voice activist, and she has the ear of vulnerable people. So, so why is it that, you know, a private citizen who can, who can make these comments and characterize this way, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't think that's as damaging personally. Like a private citizen, when you when you're in a position where you uh, you are connected to a, the community, that you have the ear of vulnerable people, then I think you have a responsibility with that. And and quite frankly, this wasn't meant to be a big public issue here today. This was a phone call from a chief of police to a board of directors to say, "I'd like to come in and discuss it." This is how this started. It did transpire into this, though, uh, Jenny Wright's resignation. Um, upon hearing that, what was your initial response in knowing that this stemmed from that letter? I don't think it did. Like, there's nothing in the letter. Read the letter. I, you, we're going to give out the letter today. Read that letter. There's, there's, there's no one in that meeting, not the first meeting that I went, the bigger meeting, not the meeting with the three representatives from the board. No one asked for resignation. No one asked what we wanted was the relationship to be repaired. So we're hanging out here at the St. John's International Airport because we used to have three transatlantic flights over to the United Kingdom and now we have zero. So I spoke with Destination St. John's to get their thoughts on what that means to tourism here in Newfoundland and Labrador. That interview, that interview sorry, is coming up.
good job. Uh, welcome. Welcome back to Here and Now. Now, uh, earlier in the show, we spoke with Dave Connors from the group Newfoundland Ireland Direct about their fight to reinstate the flight from this airport directly into Dublin. And I guess back in early 2018, we used to have three direct flights from this airport heading over to the United Kingdom. We had one going to Gatwick, we had the Air Canada flight going to Heathrow, and we had the direct flight going to Dublin. But now we have none because two of them have been cancelled by WestJet, and the third has been grounded due to the Boeing MAX 8 planes. But, so I was wondering earlier today what sort of impact this might have on tourism, missing out on these three flights bringing people from the United Kingdom here to Newfoundland and Labrador. So I popped by Destination St. John's to speak with their CEO, Kathy Duke. Here's a little bit of that interview. Well, I guess the, our unique selling proposition when we were marketing in the UK and Ireland was uh, we went by the theme closer than you think and the fact that you can get here in four and a half hours. And our experience is that once the visitor heard that, uh, they just were astounded by it, that you could get to Canada in four and a half hours. So um, I think that air access is very important to us in the tourism industry. And uh, we can market, have the best marketing programs, and we can have the most wonderful experiences. But if we can't get people here, then we're not going to be able to grow the business. So I think for us, that this route is one key route in a number of routes that are important to us in growing tourism overall. So it's not just, so the three flights you're talking about, can you just remind us which flights that those were that no longer run? Sure. Uh, we began marketing in the UK and Ireland about three or four years ago. And at that time, we had three direct flights. So you had the Air Canada direct flight from St. John's to Heathrow. Then WestJet announced a direct flight from St. John's to Gatwick. And then uh, just prior to that, they announced the one from St. John's to Dublin. So we undertook a marketing campaign in both countries. And as I said, it was a... Uh, promoting uh, the closeness of Canada to Europe. And um, you know, many of visitors there are used to a long haul holiday, and we were really wanting to put this forward as a short haul holiday, and uh, come stay a long weekend, or come and stay in St. John's, and then visit the rest of the province. And uh, the tour operators that we dealt with there who were carrying our packages and itineraries were very positive about the reaction that they were getting. So it was very disappointing to us that after investing you know, three years in the market that we found ourselves with no direct flight. There's a group now, I started with a petition online, there's a group going to have a meeting this Sunday to try to bring back the flights. What sort of benefits do you think having a direct link to Europe would mean for Newfoundland and Labrador and tourism mainly in St. John's? Sure. Um, we think there's a great opportunity. Uh, the province and uh, Destination Canada have been marketing the UK for many years. Marketing Ireland has been more recent and we've been the primary organization doing that. But the reaction that we got from uh, those that we marketed to with the tour operators, travel writers who we've had here, different agencies, uh, were quite excited about the opportunity and really felt that the visitor from Ireland or from the UK would be very attracted to what we have to offer in Newfoundland and Labrador. So we would be uh, promoting the same things that we do to others in terms of, uh, you know, obviously our culture, uh, nature, the whole landscape, the vastness of, the, of the, you know, our area. Uh, the food culture, all those authentic experiences that people are really s seeking at this time. So, um, and the Irish like to travel, and the British like to travel. So I think if we can open up those, uh, I those air access opportunities again, I think we have a great opportunity to grow the destination. So now as you heard uh, earlier, I told you that the St. John's International Airport Authority is working on a plane a plan to get a plane to fly from here over to Dublin and Air Canada has said it will bring back the St. John's Heathrow flight when that uh, Boeing 737 MAX 8 plane issue is resolved. But in the meantime, as you heard Dave say earlier in the show, if you want to go to Europe right now, you're going to have to fly through Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, and then fly back over your home province as you make your way over to Europe. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I think we should probably take a trip and just figure out how difficult it is. Maybe we can do a first-person thing. CBC can you, send you, us over. I think you and me, we could probably have a good time in Prague. Sounds like a plan. Let's just see if the bosses will pay for it. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. All right. Sounds good, Peter. I appreciate it. Now, earlier in the show, you heard how the curling community in Saskatchewan is grieving the loss of one of its up-and-coming athletes and reeling from her unexpected death. Over the weekend, Allie Jenkins died giving birth to her daughter. A rare occurrence in Canada, but not rare enough. The CBC's Bonnie Allen has more on that story. Yeah. Allie Jenkins was a fierce competitor. Three. I just so you can see here she's handling the pressure. She was admired for her dedication to curling and to her young family. 
On Sunday, Jenkins gave birth to a baby girl, then died from a rare complication in which amniotic fluid seeps into the bloodstream and the heart fails, the lungs collapse. The news came as a complete shock to our organization as well as our all of the curlers in Saskatchewan and, and across the country. The head of Saskatchewan's curling organization, Ashley Howard, says the community is in shock. The unexpected nature makes things very difficult, uh, but also what a great person that Allie was. Dr. Jennifer Blake says the cause of amniotic fluid embolism is unknown and unpreventable. The rate is around 1 in 20,000 births. That sounds pretty rare until you think that in a city of Toronto, for example, you'd have well over 20,000 births in a year. And it's often fatal. A mother's only hope for survival is life-saving measures by medical staff. Blake says the country needs a better way to track and reduce all maternal deaths during childbirth. I don't think most Canadians realize that we don't have the system to get the data. She believes if that happened, more deaths could be prevented. Back in Saskatoon, Ellie Jenkins' teammates and friends are reeling. I didn't want to believe it because honestly, Allie is such a strong person. Like she, she was such a force. The curling community has lost a great one. She brought it every time. She would, with the two kids at home, she'd still be the first one here for practice. Come on guys, let's go. They're raising money to support her husband, Scott, and their three children, including Jenkins' newborn daughter, Sydney, who is still in intensive care. <sighs> I think she's a little fighter, and I think she gets that a lot from her mom. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. I like those jazz hands. I know. The weather could always use more <laughs> jazz hands. It certainly can. Yeah, today I had the pleasure of going to uh, McDonald Drive School and doing a little bit of a, a weather talk again today, which was just, again, one of my most favorite parts of my job. You mean it's not your favorite part isn't delivering us the... <laughs> 
meh fall weather that we're dealing with right now? Well, that's the other part of my job that I love doing. Uh, yeah, no, uh, we are looking at some rainy days ahead, unfortunately. We'll take a look at the setup right now. There's that area of low pressure that I was talking about a little bit earlier. Now, that rain has started in Lab City, and uh, that will change over to snow as we head through the night tonight. And you can see that. Uh, as far as the rain goes for the rest of the province, mainly just the island, the southern portion of the island anywhere. We're going to see anywhere from 20 to 30 millimeters of rain by the time tomorrow morning rolls around and about 10 to about 5 to 10 millimeters pretty much everywhere else. So here's a look at that system. There's that snow. It's going to skirt through tomorrow afternoon, bringing rain to most of the island and then some clearing in behind that. Now, as we head through the day on Friday, we will see some unsettled conditions continuing again, likely not fully gray skies, a few peaks of sun in the mix for most of us. Uh, it does look gray up through Labrador though, and then with those cooler temperatures sticking around for Lab West, it does look like we will see uh, that chance of flurries yet again. Uh, otherwise, just the slight chance of some showers. Now as we head into Saturday, we start to get back into that onshore flow, unfortunately. So it does look like RDF uh, for most of the northeast for the island and then uh, even some snow in play. It looks like for coastal areas of Labrador uh, into your Saturday and the weekend really uh, is looking quite gray for some of us. But uh, as far as your Friday temperatures go, we're going to stick with these warmer temperatures. So near seasonal, uh, even even a little bit above. So 12 degrees for St. John's with uh, some sunshine. Uh, and then the West Coast, that's where you're going to see those showers. So about 10 degrees for you. Uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting around seven. And again, those cooler temperatures, as I mentioned, for Lab West. Nain, you're looking at sunshine, it looks like, uh, but sitting around six degrees. So over the next couple of days, once we get through these warmer temperatures, we are looking at a little bit of a dip as far as uh, those temperatures go. So back down to the mid single digits, certainly to round off the weekend uh, and then into the beginning of next week as well. Sunday does look gray. And then for uh, central Newfoundland, you're looking at a dip starting Saturday, so about seven degrees and then sunshine for the most part, both Sunday and Monday, uh, with your overnight temperatures dipping down to about minus two. For western Newfoundland, same forecast, six degrees by Saturday and then Sunday, that sun peaking out, looking at a temperature near three degrees, but overnight lows hovering around the zero degree mark. Now for eastern Labrador, you're looking at uh, seven and eight degrees and then it does look like sunshine for the rest of the weekend and heading even into Monday seven degrees and uh, overnight lows though dipping quite uh, quite a bit as we start to see some clear skies through the weekend so about eight degrees for uh, or minus eight rather for western Labrador Saturday night and then Sunday you're sticking around two degrees. Take a look at this photo, a little bit of a drone shot showing those gorgeous fall colors. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. And before the break, we were taking a look at that beautiful photo. This seems to be the time of year where you want to have your camera or your <laughs> phone or something ready because everywhere you look, you get those beautiful fall colors. And they just seem to be coming into their prime, at least here in St. John's. Right yeah, they, they absolutely are uh, pretty much everywhere. We're pretty much at that peak right now, but uh, depending on whether it's sunny or it's cloudy, uh, you get a different shot, but uh, here's a look at the weather photo that we had just a little bit earlier. An absolutely gorgeous drone shot sent to us. I don't know if you know where that is. Any ideas? It's good. It's good because it gives you a I'm, lot of ideas. I'm guessing. No, I see. I was going to say West Coast, so I was already wrong <laughs> nope. here. Gambo. Gambo. Yeah. Beautiful. A great shot from Gamble. This is actually from uh, Forest Road. So Leonard Collins sent us that shot. Thank you so much for sending that in. And if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. <laughs> yeah, this is, I, I feel like this year we've been pretty lucky. The winds haven't been as strong as they have been, so the leaves are actually staying Still on the there. trees. Mm -hmm. That's always the problem. The first leaves start to change and then they all blow away all and gone. you just get a little <laughs> stick tree. So uh, hopefully, on, now I noticed you in your forecast, you were saying the winds are going to pick up over the next couple of days. So oh, yeah. Hopefully we can still, you know, those leaves cling on and we get some of those beautiful sceneries and some more beautiful photos people can send in. Potentially. <laughs> well, thanks so much for watching. Uh, Carolyn, we'll be back with you and with Ashley tomorrow night. <laughs>